or, oh, let me throw you a bag of coins. And I literally, I just do that. You know? Mm hmm. You know, I also, I know you guys are going to be so fucking done with my bullshit or just mad. The the source I clicked on to to do this recording, I was pretty sure had uh, had uh, you guys as an audio. It, oh uh, no! It's just a nice uh, uh -oh. conversation for thirty three minutes. Oh my god, that's you know I had this feeling like I wonder if I should secretly record in OBS just in case something happens on PB's end. I'm like, no, no, we, we I'm not gonna. Have, we don't have the emu the um, whatever it was <laughs> umami conversation anymore. Ooh, okay you know what this uh, presents a good opportunity to to refine to... our thoughts and cut it down <laughs> yes i think we should talk about tabletop first mm -hmm. roll 22nd foundry third and then like discuss like on each section discuss the pros and cons and then do a conclusion of like if we were going to do a new campaign, or if we were going to redo a campaign that we're currently or did in the past, what would you do? You know, because mm. I have thoughts now. Okay, yeah, let's take this as a silver lighting and not just <laughs> I'm a fucking dumbass. You're not. <laughs> I did that with I did that with Malik when I was like, Malik, we're gonna record your secret your secret vampire meeting. <laughs> Halfway through, I was like, Oh no, I haven't been recording myself. <laughs> uh oh. My favorite one was when I did like a two hour stream of Divinity Original Sin with my friend Lily years ago. No. And like no. two hours into like a four hour stream, I just like look over OBS and go, oh, no one's been able to hear any of us. <laughs> They've just been able to hear the game. <laughs> uh, it's, it's it's talking about software that's not always easy to wrap your head around. Fucking OBS, holy shit, I've been using it for years and I still make rookie mistakes like this. Anyways, uh, yeah. Hey, uh, I'm here with Malik and Mo. We've been talking for Hello. 35 minutes now, but uh, <laughs> you guys are coming in. <laughs> yeah, um, cut it. Yeah, cut, cut it, cut, editor. Cut, cut, thing cut it in. That. Yep. <laughs> editor, get that umami. Cut so... the umami. <laughs> we're dropping the umami bit, guys. Yeah. All right, we're done with the umami. Umami bit never dies, so I'm bringing it back. <laughs> I'm going to bring it back with no context in every single uh, other piece of content that I'm in. Yeah. By the way, I've forgotten to tell you to, uh, I meant to mention it uh, last time that we were playing D&D. Uh, have I told you what I've started introing my D&D games with on stream? What? I can't remember the, the impetus of this, like what gave me the idea. Um, it was one of my friends though, but I've started saying, hi everyone, welcome to blah blah blah. I'm PB, and uh, I'm joined here today by my little subbies. Because I'm a dungeon master, and they're my subbies. Oh, <laughs> I want to say something like that! <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Little Mo Chronicles. And today, I'm here with my little guys. <laughs> my little guys. Yeah, they don't appreciate... Bunch of little guys. <laughs> they don't appreciate being called subbies, and I don't really get it, but okay. Um, and... Then we're all gonna They'll talk learn like... to like it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so we're we're here today to talk about. So Malik and Mo, um, Malik is Hello. the uh, dungeon master from Tales from the Frontier, a amazing Dungeons and Dragons campaign that we all streamed like seven years ago. And if you watched Ooh. through that, but maybe you probably did know about her, but maybe you didn't know about little Mo hiding in the corner. Uh, Hi. <laughs> Mo was the the artist behind a lot of it. You helped with map making and uh, just various like you're almost like a co DM. I think would be kind of fair to say like it was no. Malik was like the storyteller and and rule rule runner in the game. But like you know you were there as like a sidekick behind the scenes, right? If you want to call me that, yeah, <laughs> yeah putting in some flavor. Yeah, yeah. All, all of the bad stuff was Mo, right, Malik? What? Hey. Huh? What bad stuff? I, yeah. When it was any bad stuff at all? For shame. You invite us here and insult us. Well. Yeah, that, that campaign was all hits. Everyone knows it. Well, I mean, <laughs> the, the lack of a season two. Still all killer, no say. filler. I am haunted. Yeah. But, um, 
So that, that that's that's the one thing. It was Mo's fault that there was never a season two. There we go. That was the one bad thing. It, the um, yeah, my my PR team is even surprised. I'm trying to make a comeback. <laughs> they said it couldn't be done. <laughs> I said it's been enough. They forgot. But uh, yeah. So tabletop sim. You two both made maps in it. We mm -hmm. kind of before I realized that uh, we weren't hearing your side of the conversation. You were both kind of regaling me with your perspectives on it because my general perspective was that it was probably as much fun as it was to have a 3D environment and, and it had a lot of like charm. Probably a little bit more difficult to make maps in it, but then uh, you both made some very interesting points as well about like yeah, the limitations and what have you. So, yeah, how about you take it away? Well, it'd be nice if uh, the table was bigger. Way to get more room to work with. Really just in general, like, having to play stuff. Just like, yeah, essentially Lego pieces is a bit of a pain. It's kind of fun, but... It's definitely just a lot more limiting factors in Tabletop Simulator compared to a lot of uh, other options. So here's a the question then. So one of the things I sometimes find myself doing as a GM is I come up with story ideas and I, I kind of run two different styles of campaigns. One of them is I build an entire world and just kind of say, hey, you can do whatever you want in it and I'll just prep for it, which is kind of what mm -hmm. I would consider like classic D&D. And that does mean that sometimes I don't have maps ready and, and sometimes I just chuck a map and just go, oh, that'll do whatever. But it also means that for like specific moments when I know they're going somewhere, I make sure that they've got appropriate maps and what have you. Then you've got the other style that I do, which is like very episodic and it's almost like adventure of the week. And I say, hey, what adventure do you want to go on? And I come up with some ideas and like throw those ideas at them and they go, oh, we'll do this one this week. And then when I've come up with the ideas, I then come to making the maps and sometimes I go, how the fuck am I going to make a map for that? Um, <laughs> do, you, do you ever, when you were running Tales of the Frontier, did you ever... Did, did you come up with ideas and then try and work out how to make a map out of that? Or did you kind of go, what maps could we make and let's come up with story ideas for that, I guess? Yeah, at least somewhat. It was kind of limiting. Just like in the... Especially for like terrain, there's really only so many options for like, you know, the, the sort of placemat, essentially. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to like, you know, just always have it be in a grass you know, green floor or gray city. Yeah. So at least somewhat, yeah, I just kind of like took what I had, mostly made it somewhat similar, you know, adventure of the week type stuff. Mm -hmm. Just like this, this is what's going on right now. And, you know, usually pretty much everyone would engage with it. Yeah. I mean, one of the mm. things I think was pretty cool is it definitely like had that kind of, sense of adventure of the week of like oh what nonsense are the gang into this time but it it never really felt like as structured as adventure of the week campaigns can feel like where it still felt like we could just kind of go wherever and do <clears throat> and do whatever it's just that like yeah it, we were invested in the story and so we got to do wild shit like uh was it boo was boo the character the boo's menagerie is that right it sounds familiar. The, uh, well, yeah, I forget what the toad guy's name was. Yeah, but I remember him. The, he was cool. Yeah, that particular uh, adventure was just like one that stands out to me. It's just like, yeah, that was just like a really cool, unique adventure that I can't even remember exactly how it it translated or like related to the main story. But just yeah, like I I, I do think you know having some limitations can be good. It's the kind of like kill your darlings sort of approach to like telling stories and what have you which you know if you've got too many options like if you have hypothetically 758 uh chairs in a folder that the largest be, that, dinner party that that might be too many options that might be too many things to to, to choose from mm -hmm. and he spends so much time just thinking about what object would be the best and you're like over analyzing every choice and then your characters don't go in that room Oh. Or they, they don't care about it, you know what I mean? 
I, I distinctly remember there was a, a map I made for um, a campaign I showed in this video uh, briefly called Songs of the Ancients, um, where I hand placed lily pads on a lake because the area of the world they were in would naturally have like koi ponds and what have you. And um, so I was like, they, they, you know, they've got to have lilies and I've got lilies put in the pond. So I'll put lilies in the pond. And uh, while I was placing them, which was taking, you know, I don't know, half an hour to, to fill this pond with, with lilies, lily pads, I was thinking to myself, like, the players will never notice or care. And I was right because the players never even went to that map. So, you know. Yeah, that's tough, dude. <laughs> yeah, that's because you're like, that's what being a game master is, baby. It's like more for yourself. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> I I do so many things on when map making that are like this is for me. This is because I <laughs> I will appreciate it, and my players might never consciously notice, but they might mm -hmm. notice if it's not there. But it's for me. It, like, it, this has to make logical sense or like this enhances it in some way or whatever so yeah i think the biggest thing about like choosing and we're gonna get to this at the at the conclusion part but like the biggest part of choosing the way you play the game so the software is what kind of players do you have and how are they going to explore and then combine that with the type of story that you want to tell I feel like tabletop simulator would be perfect. And I, I'm, I'm actually, now that I think about it, I, I would love to see like all the more stuff that they've made because it's been years since I've opened it up, even just to play like, a, you know, Red Dragon Inn, um, which is a perk. But I'm, I'm going to stay on the same train of thought, which is um, like, if you're just having like a really casual adventure where you're, you're, it's a adventure of the week and oh you're in a dungeon oh you're in a desert oh you're in a castle oh you're in a town uh or you're in a forest and those are all really easy things to build and drop stuff in and comparative to like you have a magic school that has a very particular courtyard because the i can't i can't talk about all my ideas <laughs> but you know <laughs> no, you're, you're absolutely right it's um mm -hmm. the 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 vibe of the campaign, I guess, does make a difference because th there is a there is a level of in some worlds that has to be kind of tonal consistency, and th that that campaign I mentioned earlier, I basically wouldn't use map maps made by certain artists because I'll go that art style doesn't quite fit the vibe yes. that I'm going for with this world. And oh. more recently, I ran a D and D campaign called Sundered Empire, where literally the the motto I went into with it is, "Fuck it, I don't give no fucks. <laughs> <laughs> you can play homebrew as long as it doesn't break the rules. I don't care. Um, characters break the fourth wall constantly. There is stuff that is devoid of logic because it's all about what's the most fun, ignoring mm -hmm. like narrative dissonance and what have you." And being able to do whatever I wanted, including using whatever maps I wanted, was incredibly freeing. Um, and I've also kind of gone, it doesn't really, like, the art style doesn't massively matter, <laughs> um, as long as they're good maps. Yeah. But, but, you know, if you have a world that, for instance, didn't have, as a D&D &D world, as an example, if you had a D&D &D world that didn't have the Feywild, using a map that looks very fairy-esque would probably feel a bit weird um yeah or if you're doing a story that's very kind of like dour and dark and gloomy <laughs> and you've got like the cutesy art style of some of some map makers that also might not always work because you might go oh you know this looks like the shire from the fellowship of the ring but this is a world where the shire would have been burnt down at the end by where's the, the murder yeah. where's the blood splatter you know yeah <laughs> it's too clean here yeah so, you know, th th there are elements like that as well to be aware of. And and so I think mm -hmm. with Tales from the Frontier, because it was quite a... It, it wasn't an unserious story or anything, but the world was lighthearted and charming. And so it didn't super matter if, like, you know... I'm just trying to think, like, you, you might walk into a room and be like, oh, the scale's not perfect here. It's like, it doesn't matter. It's all just representative of it. And yeah. it's like... Oh, my God. Your characters might... might 
hyper fixate on something you didn't intend to be important mm -hmm. and then you just well, you're like oh my characters do that okay i'm gonna i'm gonna put in a secret for you and then they don't it's oh my god it's it's all up to chance just to roll the dice yeah. you could say <laughs> especially when they just got little tokens and you can't like like if you if you're like if you're good at 3d modeling or something Mm -hmm. and you could like make your own little tokens in a uh, in tabletop that'd be pretty fun and that would help with like the size a little bit so the, but that would be very difficult to you know to learn yeah mm -hmm. there there is a another um 3d and there's a couple of different 3d virtual tabletops and i know wizards of the coast are making their own one but there is one that's been around for a while now called Tail Spire, which I dabbled in, but I, it wasn't for me. Mm. And I think I'm too deep into doing 2D that I would never jump ship to 3D fully. But one of the cool things with Tail Spire is they teamed up with another company called Hero Forge, and Hero Forge is a website where you can make like your characters in 3D, and it's designed for like oh, uh, I've heard of both of these token making, what have you, and it's it's great. I make so many tokens with it. Um, I, I love it. It's you know, it's all a slightly cutesy art style, so it doesn't always fit perfectly for every single campaign. But, uh, you know, it, it's really, really good. And because they're 3D models and you can buy them to 3D print, one of the things they did is they teamed up with Tailspire after lots of people asked them to, so that you can buy the 3D version of your model and import it into Tailspire, fully colored, and then Tailspire has, like, 3D lighting and what have you. So I don't know if you could theoretically do the same thing with tabletop simulator um i will say i looked into how expensive that would be out of pure curiosity and you have to be like the pro subscriber to be able to bring them into tailspire so it's something Ooh. like it's upwards of ten dollars a month and then you can't just do unlimited characters it's set number of characters per month so if you wanted to have every single character be a unique hero forge character that's gonna be not really viable um but yeah if you if you were just doing it for your player group as an example then you could and mm -hmm. Ta and tailspar does have like pre-made ones as well but yeah so i, I agree with that because like the 2d tokens again really were charming and, and your artwork for them was great mo um but like thank you it, things like you would like sometimes try and have them interact with something and because they're 2d they would like fall over or what have you and then like get stuck underneath a 3d yeah. Or what have you. So, mm -hmm. yeah i i do gotta say there's times where like i want you guys to feel the depth of the character that a token even despite how wonderful beautiful i draw their artwork <laughs> um doesn't like do the justice of like introducing them as like a figure and i like i straight up re i totally forgot about tailspire when this started coming out like they were developing it i got mm -hmm. so pumped up for it i was like this would be perfect but i i guess i just have forgot as well as like you said it gets expensive um and we already had like tabletop simulator and i know i didn't want to do that mm -hmm. and for the specific type of game i had i decided not to go through with it and now that you mentioned with the the to the token thing, I'm one of those kinds of people that I didn't buy Baldur's Gate. Shame on me, because I was like, oh, they can't look exactly the way that I want them to look. Oh. And I feel like I would go insane purchasing every single asset that I could yeah. to make a whole list. Um, but if I could like doing, we had a campaign uh, about last weekend or the weekend before where um, I had a werewolf lycanthrope show up and i described him with my words but it would have been so cool if you guys could have seen how big i'm imagining it compared to you guys you know yeah and then like if you guys had your cameras in the hallway and then you see like uh mordecai dart out that would have been cool for you guys to visually see that rather than like i don't put shaders on the map because that would be awkward and if you you might have seen me drag him from off screen so i mean i think as well uh it's interesting you kind of bring up that point which is not even like a which vtt is the best option it's just a online versus in person i 100 percent felt um and i think i've been getting better at it recently but i used to run entirely in person until about the age of 18 
Mm. And then when I started playing online and I started using maps constantly because that's what kind of ensured that my players were invested and, and uh, engaged, it then got to a point where I felt myself not describing environments or characters as much because I was like, it's in front of you. I've, I've put all the work in to make, to put the lily pads on the pond. Therefore, <laughs> you can see the lily pads on the pond. Whereas... Mm -hmm prior to that playing in person where there was very little to no visual aid you would put mm. in the description like you're an author and you're right that you, there is like i would absolutely love it if you could see the full scale of a creature or what have you um yeah I, you know it'd be kind of cool in a way if you could almost like do cut scenes in in a, in a virtual tabletop where like you take control of everyone's camera and you show them a particular thing yeah I don't know how that would work but like you know it'd be mm -hmm. kind of cool but um but yeah, like I, I, as I say, I think I, I had to work my way back to kind of going, oh, I actually, I should be putting description in as well because this is still, even if it's not fully theater of the mind, ultimately mm -hmm. playing a tabletop game is always somewhat theater of the mind. And I think if you don't put any description in whatsoever, which is what I felt myself doing sometimes as players would enter a room and I just would not describe it at all, I'd just be like, you've entered the room. Um, is mm -hmm. that then it stops being something that they're imagining and it becomes this is the stuff directly in front of you whereas like again going back to something like tales from the frontier as much as i remember some of the 3d maps by and large i don't really remember the 3d maps i mostly remember memories of the, the events that happened which are conjured in my head like i was reading a novel yes um, like mm -hmm. apophis fucking a doorknob or was what? it a door or was it a doorknob? I can't remember which one he fucked. Oh my god. It was a magic door mode. Did you, did you know yeah, it? it was like a... Oh. On, it was essentially like a... A door with like a magical talking face on it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there, was, there wasn't there was any anywhere for it to really go. It was yeah. just kind of, you know... Just kind of going in there. Yeah. But, you know, I for some reason I've got that visual image in my head. Like, it's one of the ones I'd kind of like to get rid of, but, you know... <laughs> yeah, and I mean, there are plenty of times when, you know, we would just essentially pull our tokens on just the edge of the map and just be, t you know, talking so about something. Mm. Mm. You know, just like, especially like, if you're all like, trying to like go somewhere and like, because mostly I tried to like, kind of lead y'all to an area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then just kind of put a bunch of side stuff around. And, you know, not really tell you, like, exactly, like, how to advance the main quest in a way. So that way you're just kind of left there, like, well, I guess we'll just look around and see what's happening. Bother this old man. And eventually, you know, eventually at some point they'll stumble across something to lead them back onto the main quest. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the, the trick in general of being a, a good game master. And, um, again, it's something that I think you particularly because we were probably one of the rowdiest groups I've ever been a part of, other than maybe the group that Mo has now, um, <laughs> is putting the tracks back in front of the players without feeling like you're putting the tracks back in front of the players. Is I don't know whether you like waited for us to trigger the thing you had pre-planned every single time, or whether you just like, okay, the now in a garden, oh, you notice a spooky thing over the wall, or what, I can't remember the specifics of it, I just remember we were, like, in a cemetery at one point, and, like, suddenly we, like, found ourselves in the basement of the palace, I want to say, it was... I remember that. Yeah, and, like... I, That's the map I definitely remember making. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember whether that was, like, specifically that was what you'd already planned, or it was, like, these numbnuts are just not... <laughs> not going anywhere near the main plot here the main plot is now here <laughs> yeah i also forget like like i had had all that area planned out but i i don't remember if that was how i planned for y'all to get down there yeah it might have just been usually I, I try to keep like multiple options and like just like you know hopefully you'll stumble across hey there's a thing over here like if you go look Hey, look, guys. You put your trust in them. <laughs> you guys can figure this out. I believe hey, in you. Hey, can y'all roll a perception for me real quick? <laughs> yeah, there's something real important over there. You should probably go look at it. <laughs> oh, you all, got, you all got below a five? This is probably something important. You feel like there's something important around yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, there's something important around, but... I don't Just, know. like, mentally, like, lower that DC check. Like, no, it was never a ten. It was, it was really low. 
Oh, I mean, fudging the numbers. It's why <laughs> it's why game masters roll behind a screen or like have the roles hidden <laughs> when they're running it online. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. you 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 just hit the the bad guy and did enough damage to kill him. He actually has ten more no. hit points than that, just so I can teleport him out just before you kill him. <laughs> no, no, I didn't do it. What are you talking about? No, no. What? No. Card counted. No. I've only done that like a handful of times. I'm usually honest with that sort of thing. I mean, mm -hmm. the rule I do make, which means that I can't lie about it ever, is I always reveal nat twenties to players because I'm just like, oh yeah, sorry, man. absolutely. I mean, I, I say I always reveal them. It is like it's gonna like compl like I'm fine with downing someone. Um, Brother, you're decimated. <laughs> yeah, if it's like I've just <laughs> taken out three of you in one hit, I'm like, no, nah, it wasn't a nat twenty actually. <laughs> Like I will just pretend it's not an actually. So anyway, mm -hmm. that happens sometimes, but So yeah, so tail uh, not tails, um tabletop simulator, um limited in terms of your options, but then that can actually be good in a way, but also a quite mm -hmm. time consuming and finicky to kind of set up. But yeah, as kind of all saying and I think a decent chunk of this was before I realised I'd fucked up the recording. Um, it's got a lot of charm to it and like playing in, in 3D like being able to like you know race over to see when people have rolled a dice what the result was um, seeing mm -hmm. people like fiddle with stuff doodling in 3D all of that is quite uh, fun and charming so yeah I think that's uh, there's something nostalgic about it I think I would recommend it if you were doing Okay, I'd recommend it if you already own Tabletop Simulator and you have, like, if you're thinking about becoming a DM, right? Or you know someone who's thinking about becoming a DM and owns Tabletop Simulator, boot that bad boy up and look for cool mods and tokens to download. And if you find a good collection of stuff to kind of start and roll off of, I think it'd be totally worth it. it especially if you're doing something as simple and simply exploratory like simple ex exploration as like a medieval fantasy right um was... maybe they built like a lot of cyberpunk stuff or a lot of like steampunk stuff i wouldn't know but if they did like i get like it would i guess it would suck for you to go in and not have anything to build what you want to do yeah i, I would also say as a caveat, yeah as a caveat to what you just said though mo mm -hmm. um Absolutely, if you've already got it, it could be a good option. The other thing I would say, which is not to deter people from it, but just to kind of put it as a word of warning, is uh, if one of or a lot of your players haven't yeah. used Tabletop Simulator a lot, it might take a while for them to get used to how to control it. Because whenever I bring in, like, whenever we bring in a friend who hasn't really played Tabletop Simulator before to play a board game or a card game, and they're like, Oh, I, I just want to pick up one card, and they accidentally pick up the entire deck or whatever it might be. So you know that there are definitely like some control quirks that take a while to get used to. But yeah. I wouldn't say that that should deter you from doing it. But just kind of like, just because you know how to use it and you've already got it, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a super smooth transition for everyone. If there's someone who's never used it before. Yeah, agreed. I think if you already own it and all your friends already own it, it'd be a good thing to consider. Um, I don't I don't think since the audio cut that we discussed that the biggest drawback is that everyone has to own tabletop simulator mm -hmm. and then everyone has to download all of the modules. Yeah. Rather than one person being the host and other people getting to join in. So well, that's a huge setback. Yeah, I mean y'all you essentially stream in the modules if you don't have them, but yeah, you still have to download like to join. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at least you don't have to like have the exact same mod list or anything, but it can, you know, potentially be bad if you have poor internet, if you have some big oh, mods. Yeah. yeah. I also think, thinking back to it as well, it's probably the most intensive one. I would say with an asterisk that Foundry probably can be a similar level of intensive. But, like, mm -hmm. if you've got, like, lower internet speed, I, I distinctly remember there was a, a handful of times where I was joining uh, while, like, staying at my parents or whatever uh, over, like, a, a, a you know, half-term break or what have you. And so I was on my laptop with a single screen with a shitty mouse and really bad internet playing with a bunch of people in America. And I'd be like, 
Okay, Angel, can you do can you do my rolls for me, please? Because <laughs> I physically can't move my camera over to the dice and roll it every single time. It's <laughs> taking too long. <laughs> so yeah, there is that element to it as well. But yeah, overall, I think it's it's an it's an interesting option, and and it's not by any means a bad option. It just it comes with a lot of like. It's probably the most mixed bag option. Um, yeah. If you think it's going to be, if it's going to be fun and charming, uh, the campaign, then I think the game can absolutely add to that because it's quite fun and charming to play in that sort of environment. Mm -hmm. so. I feel like it would be the most charming for people that were, like, if you were all friends, you know, as as kids and you guys, or as adults, and you went to the game store to play D and D together, and then you all move apart. And you all wanted to play, ha have that feeling again. I feel like Tabletop Simulator would be the most nostalgic for you. It's definitely the closest vibe-wise to ever be to ever playing in person that I've ever felt. Which doesn't yes. necessarily mean it's been the best experience, but it's been like the closest <laughs> to being at a table, other than physically being at the table, because mm -hmm. you know there there isn't a certain element of looking around a, a table, and even though they're like the profile pictures of your mates on Steam. It's like that, you know, that represents them, you know. I, mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, you see their little hand moving around. Yeah. <laughs> like, I know that now I can mow a people, but to me, the, the icons in Discord these days. I'm a person. I'm a real boy. I'm a person. I'm a My little name guy. is Anakin. <laughs> um, shall we move on to roll 20? Yeah, I think Roll20 is like the easy one to talk about, right? Because it's, it's mm -hmm. free entry. Um, that You don't get a lot for free entry, but it is completely free. Um, mm -hmm. And when I say not a lot, it's you can run a game. You can create a game. It runs on their servers. Um, and you do have some file storage. I looked it up in the video. So if you're watching the video, it was, it was in the video earlier. <laughs> um, uh, but it's not a lot, so you can have music in there and you can have some maps in there. But if you're doing a lot of maps and a lot of custom artwork and a lot of music and what have you, you're going to hit that limit relatively quickly. You can also subscribe, and the subscription is not super expensive per month. I think the cheapest one's $5 yeah. a month. Um, and then there's another one that's possibly 10 or 15 a month. Again, it was in the video earlier because I looked at it earlier. Uh, um, so, you know, it's got good options. And then also marketplace-wise, I think Roll20's marketplace is really, really good in terms of what is available there. And Yeah. Um, if you Easy if, to search stuff. Easy to search stuff. If you buy, like, an asset pack or a map pack off of the Roll20 marketplace, it doesn't use up your in-game storage. Um, so, like, yeah, you, you can have maps that are made by other people that you've bought off the Roll20 marketplace. And they're just in your game without using up your storage, which is nice as well. So all of that's really, really great. And again, if you just want to be able to roll dice with your friends, completely free option as well. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to use. And they are adding more functionality, including some functionality that I'm fairly certain is a direct response because they saw Foundry do something cool and they went, we want to do that too. Um, but I think, you know, that sort of reaction to another company doing a good thing is always, that that's good for the consumer, right? If, if competitors are going, ooh, we need to up our game to stay up with our competitors, that's good for everyone. Yeah. Right? So, um, so, yeah, I think it's it's a pretty easy recommendation. I just think that it's also not got as much options as the other option we've got, which is Foundry. That's kind of my take mm -hmm. on Roll20. Yeah, the UI has a lot left to be desired, but considering that, like, you could just have, like, the DM or someone who is hosting, I guess, the DM, um, be the subscriber, then you can get all that cool stuff that's, like, I think, like, the biggest one for me would be the Fog of War slash, like, shadows, dynamic shadows and stuff, dynamic lighting. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's what allured me into... The, using that program instead of uh, Tabletop Simulator, which does have a fantastic uh, fog fog of war, but it's not exactly the same uh, because you as a little guy can just kind of roll around and be like, it looks like part of the castle goes up here, you know? Um, and... Oh yeah, we didn't touch on the fog of war thing in Tabletop, but... Yeah, I don't think it has a height a... function, does it? Yeah, no, it's... 
It's pretty much just like little screens. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be real. I didn't even remember I had Focal Pool. <laughs> yeah, because I remember you guys going through um, that map that I helped make, which was the the underground like castle slash cemetery. Um, Is this the, the mausoleum? That, yeah. And uh, I remember there being a fog of war, and I I can't remember exactly, but I think someone was like. Hey, it looks like there's like a secret passage here, because <laughs> because the fog of war wasn't like exactly aligned with the tokens, because gotcha. it like had a curve or something. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas with tabletop simulator or um uh, with two roll twenty, uh, there's too many T's. Um, there's no T's not. in roll twenty. Oh, okay, yeah, actually, if you spell it out, fine. <laughs> it's at the end, but you, yeah, you, you, it's not at the front, so that's the confusing part. Um, yeah, it has a lot of perks, super accessible. I think it's like if you, I, I'm glad that I was able to use that as someone who still is like feeling new to role, like Dungeons and Dragons and role playing games. It's a great way to kind of ease yourself into doing that online with friends. Um, yeah, the marketplace feature is amazing. It's much better than foundries. It's, I think like one of the few places that just has like super accessible maps and tokens and stuff. Whereas like, I have to go find Patreons. I have to go to Reddit to find maps. I had to draw my own maps. Um, I have basically at, I've only used like a hand, like on my hand, like five different tokens that I've placed on the map for more visual effect. And that's a shame, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It's cool that I found maps that are, like, usable, but I do miss kind of using the Lego pieces, and Roll20 made that super easy. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, for, for me, what I do... Which thankfully most stuff that you buy in Roll Twenty you can download to your computer, but then it's using up storage and you've got to like have it filed mm -hmm. properly. Is I just basically download most of my things from Roll Twenty and then uh, make them myself or use the pre-made ones, which bring them into Foundry. But yeah, I mean Foundry doesn't really have a marketplace at all. The closest thing is its module. Mm -hmm. Um library i guess would be the word you call it which is not for maps it's for modules and even then within the foundry application you basically can't find a module unless you know its name so you have to look it up on foundry's website then go mm -hmm. cool i want that one and then go find it on the foundry application to install it you can't install it from the website you have to go into the application to install it but you can't browse we well, can you can browse in Foundry application, but it's you, fa you you either browse all or you browse by keywords, which means yeah, you have to know the name or something. So like, okay, if you know yeah. if you know you want a map that does I don't know weather, you could search for the word weather on there and then find all mm -hmm. the different ones. But even then, you're not going to be able to look at like the images to them and, or anything like that within the app. So it is kind of like a two step process. Yeah, and I feel like there's um like. You have to hope that the people who made the module give you a visual representation of what it would look like on the map. Some people are just like, here's a script, download it. And I'm like, that's not even, I have to input that script manually? Like what? And then um, then there's like the world module functions where like in my game, I use like the simple world building, which I regret because it'd be so cool to have the character sheets, but I have a homebrew. So it's different. And then, it took me a lot of experimenting with the ones that you recommended, PB. They were the best ones, that, the ones that you recommended, because I accidentally downloaded the incorrect ones first. Mm -hmm. I cannot wait for you to produce these videos, by the way. Um, but uh, So I downloaded the correct one. I was like, this works, but it's still confusing. Yeah. I, mean, it's... I think with, with any... Um, with any... Uh virtual tabletop homebrew is always like homebrew system um is always going to be pretty difficult to get to work a again ironically except for maybe tabletop simulator because there's no system in tabletop simulator it's just dice rolling 
any yeah. system stuff isn't is done entirely out of tabletop simulator carrot sheets and what have you so mm -hmm. yeah yeah i don't like that if you make a world system you can't just change the character sheet i don't understand why they wouldn't just let me go nuts what's holding them back yeah i mean i imagine uh, eventually mm -hmm. i would i would be very surprised if foundry doesn't one day either create a system or create a module that just lets you create a fully customizable character sheet mm -hmm. um because not that i've ever run an entirely homebrew system on foundry but i run star wars saga edition which does have a module on foundry but it's done by like an author of one like it's a single person team or like a very small team they don't mm -hmm. keep it updated very often because it's a very small team and yeah it's just not great this is no shade at the person making it because it's it's like as i say i think it's literally one person um foundry so, doesn't make it easy no and it's, and it's this one person supporting a system that's been dead for uh, probably <laughs> in the region of like uh, between 12 and 15 years i can't remember exactly i think they stopped making it in like 2009 wow. so what's that 14 years so uh, yeah, you know, I I, I can't crazy. really blame it for not having the best support for that particular system, but you know, it it I ran uh, an entire campaign on Simple World, and then I moved on to another one that I will cover in another video because it's quite complicated to explain. But uh, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. So in conclusion, uh, Roll Twenty is like the easiest one to recommend by far. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, it's just I've, super easy to use. I've had a lot of uh, good sessions in that. Um, not ever really long running. I was still kind of in the middle of like trying to find the right D and D group and trying to figure out what I wanted to do as a DM and still experimenting. But I do remember it being pretty easy. And if you have the right packs of stuff to build maps with, it's um, it's not challenging to lean into. Yeah, I mean, other than the rigged dice, roll twenty is all right. <laughs> Fair. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, but uh, I also think it's probably in in terms of in terms of other functionality, it's just like Foundry offers tons more. And again, I I think this was done before the recording. If not, I'm repeating myself. But Foundry, it feels like has virtually limitless potential in terms of what it can do all it requires mm -hmm. is someone who knows how to code it to code it and then keep it updated with foundry updating and make sure it doesn't conflict with any other modules so it's not always going to work because you know if you've got 30 it's like modding a video game if you've got 30 modules running in foundry they've all got to run together otherwise yeah. something's going to break so there are limitations to it but theoretically if someone's really good at coding and make sure that the module doesn't mess with any other module and they keep it updated with Foundry, there's no reason why you can't do virtually anything. To mm -hmm. the point where, and again, I'm pretty sure this was before the recording, before I realized the recording was fucked up, there is a module in Foundry that lets you turn Foundry, a 2D top-down <laughs> virtual tabletop, into a fully 3D tabletop-like tabletop simulator. And I don't understand how, and I've never looked into it, because it's not for me. But, you know... If you can do that, yeah, that sounds pretty insane. Yeah, yeah. If you can do that, you can probably do anything. Um, so, yeah, yeah. I love um, to talk. Start talking about because we were mostly talking about um, roll twenty to kind of move further into Foundry. I'm glad that I bought it. I don't regret it, but it feels like. And Adobe product where Roll20 or Tabletop Simulator feels more like Procreate in the way that, for all my artist heads out there, uh, you have one program that's really, really complicated. It has all these amazing features. Um, it is complex, and it can make exactly what you want. It's got a, it's got a lot. It's powerful. And then you got these other nice two little guys that are kind of bare bones, but they're simple in comparison and easier to use in comparison, especially for, I feel like, 
newbie DMs, not necessarily newer players, but I feel like Foundry is so overwhelming as I feel I feel like the campaign I'm running now is kind of really my first official. You know what I mean? I feel like all the rest was really just practice. Mm. Um and it's a lot. Talking about the modules again, if I can't up currently update to Foundry 11 because a lot of my modules don't go to 11 yet. Mm -hmm. Or I'll download a module that I'm like, oh, this is great. It, it puts items onto the map. It's like, sorry, I only work with this world system. Yep. I'm You can't use me. And I'm like, well, why? It's not really no. that different. <laughs> no. You're not allowed. I yeah, want I mean, it. <laughs> one thing I will say as well with, with Foundry, which there is no guarantee that this is across the board but my experience with foundry has been that the community tends to be incredibly nice and helpful um yes so exactly on that note i had a system I had a module that didn't run in anything other than dnd fifth edition um and i reached out to the author and i was just like hey i love your module because i use it in dnd fifth edition but i'm currently not running dnd fifth edition hypothetically is it even possible for you to make this run in a different system? How much work would it be? Like, please, please, please. <laughs> hypothetically, if you've got the time and it's not too much work, could you do it? And if it is too much work or it's going to take a lot of time, like, could I sponsor you? Like, you know? <laughs> and they were like, yeah, no, it's, it's a lot of work. And I was like, cool, I don't understand Whoa. coding, so I'm just going to believe you on that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, all right, fair. Um, so yeah, at least they're, they're like, you know, pretty chill about it. And as I say, like, he considered it. He even said that he was like, I'll look into how much work it is. And then came back like a week later and was like, it's a lot of work. And I went, Fair. <laughs> Man. Yeah. I feel like, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm probably going to see something other than Foundry succeed before Foundry becomes easier to use. You know what I mean? Challenge Which accepted. I... I'm going to make you a pro at Foundry. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like there's so much stuff I like about it. The UI is very beautiful. Lots of cool modules. It's really easy to create a handcrafted world. It's awesome for like deep storytelling. Um, and it does have modules that like, and uh, ways to like use the roles that you type and make it um, work with your character sheets and stuff. And it's complex, it's cool. I don't know. I just kind of feel like overwhelmed. I don't feel like I should have to know how to like drag my way through it comparative to like how easy DMing should be where you're just sitting down at your chair. You got your little sheet in front of you and then you just tell a story, you know? I'm like, oh crap, Angel can't see because I didn't turn her token on. Oh, hey, here's your spell card, which by the way has to be a weird item instead of just like spells like I do, and then like oh well it's not on this token on this part of the map and then um yeah so like yeah. A, a lot of that is just understanding the, the logic of the system and I, I do agree it's not as easy to wrap your head around the logic as it is with something like Roll20 or Tabletop which doesn't have any of that sort of functionality regardless so yeah. you have to wrap your head around it um that's true Foundry does have a bunch of wikis that you can read up on but you know it's, there it's are, a lot of yeah. homework at that point sort of thing. So. There, there's a lot of like, people have already done the troubleshooting for you, so you can probably find an answer to figure out what your problem is. Um, that being said, there is like some pretty tough tech issues that come with like basically hosting your own game as a DM that was, I think, one of the most it's not infuriating but it was aggravating because I'm the kind of person that if the technology isn't working, why the heck not? That's what it was designed for. We had a problem where I was about to host a game, but because I got a new service provider and I moved, the um, the AT&T was like, no, we, sorry, that port isn't open. But I didn't know that. I didn't even know what a port was. And then the the people at Foundry have like mods and then those mods have people that they'll recommend to talk to you. And then you get in a call and the guy's like, oh, have you tried this, uh, this, and this? And I'm... <laughs> yeah, have you tried basic thing? 
have you tried um hey your mic's not working hey um have you tried can you hey can, can you, you do this for me can you oh okay that's not working oh, hang on can you call your friend in here <laughs> I, I do have one question though mark uh-huh <laughs> if you'd ran a, a game in foundry before this then you had to you had to set up port forwarding no i didn't okay yeah okay so here's okay I'm going to tell you about another problem I have with Foundry, which is I buy I buy Foundry. We play, I think, our first game at, my, at the old apartment I used to have back when we had, I was using Spectrum, right? Everything worked fine. And then I bought a new computer and I put all of my files on it and I move. I take my new computer to my new house and I get new internet and then we play our next game. Like a lot of that happened between then. Before the game, I had to like, I spent like a week or two trying to figure out how to like get the foundry data to work on the new computer. They were like, oh, it's easy as copying and pasting it. And I was like, it's not working. I've lost an entire plethora of, and I didn't lose it, but it wouldn't connect. And I had to like go through so much troubleshooting Um, that was so aggravating because it is, it's just like designed in a way that only people who understand computers can know it. I'm not like that. <laughs> it's tough. Oh, you don't understand computers, Mo? I don't understand. I did everything they told me to do. It took like an hour of like talking to someone. <sighs> then but I finally get it all. I Go still, ahead. I still don't understand. Like oh, the only the only way I can make this un uh, uh, make sense uh -huh. to me. Is that you must have already had a port forward set up on your previous machine on your previous internet because perhaps you can't host a game online unless you're either using another server provider like um the forge or or your port forwarding. So you you mean like I don't know what a port is, I'm going, but how though? I do yeah, I don't know. We just like we had Spectrum. I played a game on that on Foundry and it worked. And then I got the new computer, but my data wouldn't transfer over when I opened up and it was like messed up. And they're like, you sorry, you have to, I spent, I think like an hour of like talking to someone before I realized that, oh, it's because it didn't, you, you downloaded the newest version of Foundry. You have to roll back to like the 10.5. Yeah, yeah, no, you're on the 11. Sense. I'm like, that makes sense. I, when I am told that there's a simple solution after working for an hour, I lose my freaking mind. And that's exactly what happened. Okay. <laughs> when... but, but Morgan, <laughs> have you tried turning it off and on again? <laughs> I did it so many times. Um, I flipping. Okay, and so then we're playing it at the new time at my at my new apartment on my new computer. What, and I. Shh, shh, shh. Listen, listen. You call me here. You let me talk how I talk. <laughs> <laughs> and then I. We boot it up and no one can connect to my game because AT&T doesn't allow Foundry like you to connect to Foundry through that port. And I had to do all this troubleshooting mm -hmm. and it was infuriating. Yeah. The no, problem I... wasn't that yeah, we 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 walked her through forwarding her port. Yeah. But yeah. then once uh once yeah, Foundry then... got involved. <laughs> well, then it was we found out it was AT&T Yes. Their problem. Yeah. It so was some some ISPs will block. I can't remember what it is specifically that they block, but basically it's people connecting directly to your port when it's open. Um, mm -hmm. It's a safety feature, which makes yeah. sense. Sure. Uh, and lots of ISPs make it very very difficult to uh, mm -hmm. to fix that. Um, which again, uh, it's definitely annoying that like. It's it's the pro and con of you running the server yourself, right? Because mm -hmm. the con of it is that all of that setup and potentially annoyance with companies being frustrating. The plus side of it is that everything runs off of your computer, so yeah, storage limits and what have you are out of the window all of a sudden. Um, you know, even on the biggest subscription on Roll Twenty, I think the storage uh, <laughs> amount you have is something like three gigs, and I was hitting up against that with. Uh, with one of my campaigns <laughs> and uh this, this is not a problem anymore so you know it, it's the pro and the con 
um, of, of it is that it is it's super double edged yeah yeah and and but the the flip side of that again though is that once you're set up unless you move or what have you which case fair enough you would have to reset up mm -hmm. but once you're set up you don't need to fiddle with it sort of thing absolutely so, i think yeah if i had to like quickly because i kind of went on a little bit of a rant there and i have a habit of doing that but if i had to quickly sum it up the problem is is that there i paid for like almost 50 dollars for a product that doesn't have any like legitimate tech support it has people who will give you advice they're not tech support i don't think that mod was being paid <laughs> and bless her heart for dealing with me but <laughs> bless her heart but she Did told she need me to get a boba tea before dealing with you oh yeah Maybe we both needed it just be like yeah you should go over tea next time for you she was like really passive aggressive with me i feel like she was like sending me like an aggressive smiley face like uh looks like you didn't do everything i told you to do because by the time you replied that wouldn't have been enough time and i'm like i'm telling you that i'm almost confident that this whole selection of things you're telling me to do isn't going to work i already did like half of it nothing's changing and then it really did just turn out to be that if I had called my service provider and asked them, hey, can you open up this port? They did it in like five minutes. It just, it, I just had to have the number of like the tech support to call. It fixed it in five minutes where I wasted like an hour, I think almost like an hour and a half doing all the things that people who are not tech support were telling me to do. Yeah. I mean, Foundry is a significantly smaller um, company. Mm -hmm. Like, I have no idea how big the team is, but Roll20 is. I mean, to be honest, I don't blame them. Even if they had regular tech support, I wouldn't blame them for not knowing that some ISPs apparently block your shit like that. I mean, I feel you know, like the, the flip side of that, if they did have paid tech support, is that at this mm -hmm. point, I would expect them to know that because surely they've had enough people message them about that. At this you point. know what the thing is? Is that she knew that that was a solution, and she said, well, you tried all these things, and you... you you deleted all of your firewalls. Looks like you're going to have to call your ISP. And I, so I said blatantly, like, I'm sorry, why was that the last thing that was recommended? I'm frustrated because I just wasted an hour and we have to reschedule when I could have used 10 minutes to call my ISP first. And she's like, well, we have an order of operations. And I was like, well, I think I'm going to yeah, talk shit about a, you. That YouTube. is literally, unfortunately, a customer service thing. We're like, yeah, you're, you're not allowed to immediately direct them to like, the outward thing you have to keep them in your system if until they leave basically it's that's i, I don't know I, th I think as well like from my perspective in, in my job i don't do tech support per se but it it rubs up against tech support because it's system mm. support uh and process support and you do get people who are like you know you want to assume that they're not an idiot, which I'm not saying you yeah. are, just to be clear. But you listen, want, I don't. <laughs> you want to I don't know what a port is. <laughs> so yeah, you see a lot in in any sort of support. So you go, <laughs> okay, well, um, it's it's got to be something more complicated than the Occam's razor, which is the most simple option, and and then it turns out that no, it's just because they didn't click this button or whatever. And you yeah. Go, well, okay. I I feel which, like you know. It, it, it might be an element of that as well but ultimately yeah it's it's a, yeah. it's a smaller team it's a smaller company um so i i do expect on the, on the one hand support's probably lesser but on the other hand support's mm -hmm. probably a bit a bit more personal um i, I don't think i've ever actually contacted roll 20 support but i imagine that roll 20 support is probably hmm. very kind of it's an old system, you know. It's been around for a long time, comparative to Foundry. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised at all, though, if I went to contact Roll20's customer support and I had to go through, like, a web chat that, like, tried to direct me to the right place, <laughs> first of all, sort of thing. That's the sort mm -hmm. of, like, level of, like, bigness they are, is that that's an efficient way to, for, of them to deal with people contacting them, which is fair, but that then obviously is less possible. Yeah. <laughs> so, Any yeah. company of size has to do that yeah. to filter through calls. Otherwise, yeah. it's just impossible. I feel like the more that I think about when I have a frustration like that, that will pivot me to never have an interaction with that element ever again. But I had already put so much into Foundry that I was like, 
no, it's fine. Like, I'm so glad. And as you said, now that it's fixed, I'd never have to worry about it again, unless I move or get a new service provider. But at least I know those tricks now, right? Mm -hmm. um, I feel like you would never have to worry about tech support with tabletop simulator you would like know immediately oh there's too many items on the board or oh someone doesn't have good connectivity or there's lag it would just be that simple with roll 20 i can't imagine people having tech problems other than hey like um i keep rolling once <laughs> you know yeah unless they literally just have like an ancient laptop or something they're trying to run it on like you shouldn't yeah. have any problems with the web browser. I mean, I, yeah. I, to be fair, I have had players have issues before, but it has always been clear cache and it works sort of thing. So it's like really mm -hmm. basic browser support, which if you don't know about that sort of thing, you might not know and you ha might have to contact Roll20's support. But, you know, the general rule of thumb on the internet is that like if a website's taking forever to load, that has a lot of like visual stuff, try clearing your cache. It's a pretty good idea of like close on unnecessary programs, those sorts of things, you know? So. You know, Another thing, too, is talking about cache. Foundry, because it works as a browser, which I had no... I mean, of course, now I understand it works as a browser because I guess a lot of games work that way, but I didn't know it was a browser. I thought it was like... It was like a game, kind of like Tabletop Simulator. Like, it was a program that ran off my computer, not like a, a different type of Chrome or a different type of Firefox. Um, and... Well, I mean, like, isn't it a program that runs on your computer yeah, or something? It is. The, the server is hosted and the players connect via browser, but it runs off of your computer. It's, a, it's an application. See, that's so... It's complicated. <laughs> and <laughs> what I have to do is, like... It's okay, I, man. You don't understand computers. It, it's a .exe I, file. I don't understand. Man. It's a .exe. I'm just, <laughs> it's an exe. I'm, I'm just a girl. I don't understand. Wow. Why are you bringing gender <laughs> into this? <laughs> yeah, we're trying, to, we're trying to get more girls in STEM. Yeah. <laughs> we gotta let them know we're inclusive we gotta get the girls in here um uh so i was having a problem with just like testing out maps and downloading stuff i will have the music test and play while i because i want to see if it fits the vibes right and um i started to realize i'd open up and activate a map and the music wasn't playing and i was like what is the problem and they're like oh you have to refresh the cache you have to press like Control F5 or whatever, Alt F5. I don't remember which one it is, but to like, five, but... yeah, that's what I did. And so then it would refresh my program. And I was like, this is kind of crappy. Yeah, I feel like that's again, possibly user error of, of you yeah. not knowing the most efficient way to sort out. Because I, I don't know specifically the situation like... you're talking about, but I've never had to like refresh Foundry to get music to start playing. It's right. and I so I made a well at first what I was doing is I would just have a music file somewhere on my computer mm -hmm. and like it would be organized but it wouldn't be in the data folder it wouldn't be like in the foundry uh, folders. That was your first mistake. I still think it's not working because then I would like take the one once I figured it was that I took all the music folders and I made a music folder in the foundry folders. Like where it's with all the tokens and other stuff. Like it's, you can make folders that appear in the selection. Mm -hmm. And I sourced it from there. Like I resourced all the music and I'm still having this problem. And I'm like, can I just like have it not cache so much stuff if this is the problem? You know? Yeah, um, I, I still don't know specifically what the problem you're having is. Cause again, like this is not a thing I've yeah. ever, ever run up against. It's just that stuff. Cause works. I'm a girl. I, 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 I'm not a gamer guy. It, it's probably just like understanding the logic again. So for instance, one of the things it could be, which I don't think it is, but it could be, is if you're setting a particular music file to play on a map when you go onto that map, mm -hmm. it won't play unless that map is the active map. So Yes, no, no. I, uh, yeah. Hey, I know that. Okay, cool. Hey. So it's, 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 the chances <laughs> are, though, it's something like that that is happening. Yeah. It's because... definitely a refresh problem. It's like I would press, I would, I would activate the map, and then the music would be at zero out of zero. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, it's the name is there, like it's it's supposed oh, to be playing. Okay. And then I would have to refresh it, and then it would start playing it again. And you guys can have it play what, on your end, and not on mine. Format are you using? 
uh, MP3. Hmm. I've heard that there's a better one to use though, like a O, like it starts with an O or something. MP3 should be fine. WAV tends yeah. to be a little bit problematic for me. But... Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the point I'm trying to make. Good. Shut up! <laughs> Shut up! Yeah, um, I recommend that as well. Um, could you just like understand basic information? Could you just like be smarter? Um, smarter, please come on. Shut <laughs> up! And I. I think the point I'm trying to get at is that Foundry has a lot of points of error that can happen. It has so many opportunities to fail, which can make it really frustrating. It's like it has so much it can do, and that causes a lot of, um, not variables, um, it's where it there's an opportunity to attack it, you know? Yeah. I, I would, Vulnerabilities. I would counteract that and say, if, if you're not bringing any modules into play and you're just talking about Foundry, yeah. there's not actually that many. But That's true. But they are still more complicated than they are on any other system. Therefore, mm -hmm. you need to wrap your head around them, such as port forwarding. Um, as okay. soon as you bring modules into it, absolutely, you need to. And, you know, I recently uh, sent mo a spreadsheet of all the different modules i have and just created yes. a page for her so that she could have all the modules she had because what <laughs> i was getting really frustrated by was if i created a new world or i re uh, updated foundry i'd be like oh fuck it i got so many that i don't use <laughs> or i only use on this game and not that and i don't remember so i had to like you know do an organized of this is all the modules i have and what they do and which ones I use for which game because it was getting too complicated to kind of keep a, uh, keep my head on the top of it. So, mm -hmm. I think that when it comes down to it, Foundry is, I think, really great for people who are experienced with sto like storytelling and computers and being a dungeon master. It's really great for all of those things. Um, it's got an excellent UI. It's got so much it's going to do and be able to do but it can be really frustrating in certain conditions yeah i mean i guess what i would ultimately sum up with if i'm going to use you you kept on using photoshop and uh, paint shop pro and yes paints and yeah a lot of my maps are from patreons or from reddit and but then I have to draw some maps myself in Photoshop, oh, and I was those just talking were talking about your your metaphor where you were comparing them with like oh right 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 yeah yeah mm -hmm. where you were comparing like one of them's Photoshop and one of them's uh, GIMP and what have you yeah yeah those are the programs I used um and uh, I I'm going to use my parallel which is cameras which is mm. that Roll Twenty is a very high quality um point and click camera it does what it says on the tin. It takes really good quality photos that you point the camera at them and you take the photo and it does it. And that's it. What it can't do is go from a wide angle lens to a uh, telephoto lens without losing any quality. It uh, you, know, you can't change lenses. You can't change the flash. You can't change the, the body uh, configuration. You can't uh, have extra batteries put into the camera. Oh, you God, yeah. You can't connect it to a uh, stabilizer all the other things that you could do with a DSLR or a SLR or a mirrorless camera, because I use mirrorless, so I will continue to shout out mirrorless. Uh, the point the point being, you can't do the same things that you can with a more high-end, expensive, professional camera. But not everyone needs a high-end, complicated, professional camera. And when I used exactly. to sell cameras as a camera salesman, I'd frequently be like, you don't need to spend three grand on this camera. This 500 pound camera is doing exactly what you asked, what you're asking me <laughs> to have a camera do. I get that you have three grand. That's great for you. You don't need to spend that much on it. You want to? Fine. You know what? I'm, I'll make commission. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> I, I had a lot of customers who had more money than sense. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know. Yeah, that happens. Yeah. But you get my point, is that not everyone needs that level of complexity and therefore level of possibility, but Foundry offers both, but it's the double-edged sword of as you get more potential and more functionality, you also get more complexity. 
Now, for all you computer nerds out there, I'm going to give you a little... Uh... <laughs> Tabletop Simulator is uh, essentially the Python, whereas uh, Roll20 is sort of like C++, and Foundry is uh, like Assembly. And if you're not, if you're not a camera uh, computer or uh, like drawing, uh, like digital art nerd, then fuck you. We have no metaphors for you. Listen, all right. So <laughs> we can't help you. Music nerds, we can't help you. Sorry. Tabletop. Yeah, music nerds are fucked. <laughs> tabletop is like, like sweet, and then roll twenty is oh, like, no. like, like, so, like. <laughs> Sour, but then Foundry's like umami. <laughs> what we don't understand what it is. We don't understand. Um, the best part is that was all lost, so no <laughs> one's gonna get the context of that. No one gets our bits. Um, I'll say that I'm so excited for you to help introduce a lot of people to, um, like how to do stuff in tabletop roleplay online, creating tutorials which I'm sure are going to include a lot of stuff about Foundry, because I don't think there's a lot of good tutorials out there yet. There and... are plenty. I, I don't want to like say like, yeah. you're going to be the only one on it. There, you're going to be the best one. I've watched, I've watched a bunch of them. But yeah, I just think that everyone has their own unique perspective, and hopefully like my takeaways will be helpful. I also mm -hmm. think um, the one last thing I'll say on Foundry, I have never, until I used Foundry, had players go, oh, wow, that's cool in terms of a mm. thing that the application can do. Thankfully, they've done it to, like, story stuff that I've done and what have you, but never to, like, oh, the the tabletop that we're playing on can do this? That's cool. That has happened multiple yeah. times with Foundry, because I've downloaded a new module, got it to work correctly, and players have been like, that's fucking cool. Um, yeah, the journal stuff is, like, really cool. Like, getting to show you guys, like, hey, I made a whole page for how the homebrew works and how the economy works, and you guys can access it quietly at any time you know having all the spell cards showing it to the group it is really cool i think i would recommend foundry to people who don't mind getting frustrated who are like able to take the time if you were like we're gonna play dd next week don't not with foundry <laughs> you gotta i feel like you it needs a little bit more time than that um to like warm up to but it is, if you can learn it, it's fantastic. And Malik, I don't think he's ever run a game in Foundry, so. Yeah. You know, I have a question for Wait, you, what'd both. what you say? I said I don't think you've <laughs> ever run a game in Foundry, so you can't. You can't really say oh, yeah, no. game mastering perspective, which one, but. I can only say as a player, it's been pretty easy to put it in my browser and play the game. Yeah, from a player perspective, I think it's it's as easy as any other. It's mm -hmm. literally just from the game master perspective that Foundry is a little bit more difficult. I have a question for you both because I haven't DM'd in tabletop. I've helped build maps and I've watched you guys play. So that was my first introduction to D and D. Like, like, like invested in watching a story, right? Yeah, um, so, so we beat to it. <laughs> so I want to ask you guys what what do you guys enjoy playing in the most? And this could be for any reason, if it's nostalgia, if it's for the ease of use, or if it's for the amount of stuff you get out of it. Um, I would say for me as a player, I think I'm pretty easy regardless. Like I, I'm for me as a player, I don't I like I play in a campaign that's almost entirely theater of the mind and it's all on a virtual tabletop. So I don't need a lot from a virtual tabletop as a player. Um I appreciate more functionality. I guess mm -hmm. in terms of, as I say, like emulating being in person, tabletop simulator did achieve it the most, but it was also like I don't think I would want that from like I play in a cool Cthulhu campaign right i don't mm. think i would want to have to faff around with stuff getting stuck or like falling off the table or what have you when like my game master is explaining to me like some unknowable horror that i'm seeing and i'm like cool i'm gonna roll dice oh it went off the table yeah my, my... someone sorry to flip the table <laughs> my fake ear fell off the table i have to i have to spawn a new one you know yeah, exactly so like that sort of thing i'm like yeah you know it it, it, it was i think tabletop simulator was 
absolutely perfect for the sort of campaign that Tales from the Frontier was, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure it fits every sort of... It's not that it doesn't fit every single sort of campaign, because I could be absolutely fine with it, but I think it is geared yeah. towards campaigns like Tales of the Frontier, if you want to use it, that sort of thing. It's more... Yeah, a bit more limiting. How do you feel, Malik? About what? Brother, are you paying attention? Are you here with us? Brother? <laughs> you mean you got general? a pulse? About what playing? Yeah, DMing? which one? What as a player do you enjoy playing in the most? I think that's really what it boils uh, down to. Like, what's the most fun for everybody? Not just what's easy to use as a DM. I mean, honestly, they're all. If you're just the player, they're all great options. Mm -hmm. I mean, you because know, they're all kind of affected by internet issues, but some probably a bit more than others. But, you know, generally, they all provide a pretty good, just sort of, uh, I don't know, just a, a layout, I guess. Hmm. Something to help out. You say you don't have a... Uh, I do think that... You can go into a lot more detail with things like Foundry or Roll20. I think that's really, like, that helps a lot. Yeah, I feel like if it comes down to it, the more, I don't want to say elevated, but the more detail-oriented and roleplay-oriented, uh, the more serious your story is, I think it it's like a... From... It's more likely to benefit from some of the assets or some of the things you might be able to find on Foundry or Roll20. Yeah, I think that like Roll20 would be in the middle of like a semi-casual game. Roll like Foundry is very more professional storytelling. Professional is not very burnt. Formal, formal storytelling, and then tabletop would be for very informal, fun stories. Um, and that's not exclusive. That it, it it's really what you make of it. But I feel like that's kind of the vibe I get from all three, you know? I will say the last, and this is going to be the last point that I'm going to make on this because I've noticed the time is 1.30 for me and I still need to have a bath before I go to work tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the last thing I'll say on the three that's just popped into my head while we've been talking about this from a player perspective is it, specifically Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, I can't say for every single system. And I know that some systems don't do this on Roll20, but specifically for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, um, you also get the benefit of when you level up, it walks you through the level up like it does on things like D&D &D Beyond and what have you. So like, mm. oh, this is the spells you get, or this is the feature you get. In Foundry, if you're doing it entirely in Foundry as a game master, you need to both lead your players through it you know, either they can read it up in the books or you can read it up in the books with them, but you then need to add that stuff manually to their character sheet. There is no, like, yeah. character level up uh, UI. Um, and likewise, in tabletop simulators, there is no character sheet, so you have to do it outside of that. Um, I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing, but again, if you want that level of comfort, again, it doesn't work for every single system on Roll20, but it does for D&D 5th Edition, and I have to imagine it works for other, like, major systems. Like, I'd be, su I'd be surprised if Pathfinder didn't have it as an example as, like, a competitor to D&D. Um, so, yeah, that level of convenience is definitely nice as well. Um, but, yeah, Foundry doesn't have that. There are workarounds for that, such as being able to import your character sheets directly from D&D Beyond into Foundry with a module which I'll cover in a later video, but, uh, you know, uh, base, base. Make sure to like and subscribe. Make sure to like, like and subscribe. subscribe. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, as, as just baseline, that that's another thing that Roll20 gives players that, as I say, the other systems don't that we've talked about today. So, mm -hmm. any, any parting thoughts from you two? Hmm. Do you, Malik? Uh, I like D&D. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all right. Me too. I love D&D. I like Foundry. I'm glad I have it. I I hope that in the future, um, or if you watch this in the future, and you're like, what are they talking about? Foundry is super easy to use. Good. 
<laughs> I hope it gets easier to use. Yeah, I mean, I don't know for certain, but I'm pretty sure Foundry is like still, it's like version 11 at, the, at this point, but it's still like... Feels new. It's like feels not, baby. I don't think it's literally early access, but I think it's essentially early access. Yeah. Doing I think you, if you are considering like what kind of game you want to play and what kind of game you want to DM, try them all out. And don't be afraid to like spend a buck or two and see if you want to refund um tabletop simulator because even if you don't play it for D&D, there's a lot of cool things you can do in that game. And Roll20, you pay, it's free to, to try out. And then it's like five bucks a month. If, you're D, if your D&D group is like, oh, we're not going to play it for six months because some guy started working in the Antarctica and he doesn't have internet service down there, you know, <laughs> then you can unsubscribe for a little while and come back to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then Foundry is a one-time payment, just like Tabletop Simulator. So kind of pays for itself in the long run yeah just wait for that steam sale wait for that get yeah. it for like five bucks yeah you can buy a four pack for 20 bucks maybe it's a humble bundle you know yeah i don't know if it does humble bundle but i hope it does i imagine so yeah yeah i ultimately i did and this is kind of what i said in in the the video that i recorded the other day they're all good options for different purposes and it's just finding the right fit for you and I, and there are obviously Absolutely. loads of options beyond those three we've talked about a handful of them today and yeah it's about finding the right fit for you and that might take a while uh, it might take a little trial and errors uh for me i've ran in roll 20 and then foundry i never ran in tabletop sim but obviously played in tabletop sim and i'm know that i probably would never go back to roll 20 to run and i probably will never leave foundry unless like a really good competitor comes along but yeah like, you know that's not because it is de facto the best one it's just it's the one that vibes with me the most for what i want to do with my games mm -hmm. so yeah i think i'll definitely be keeping my ear on the ground as well for something better and more accessible because i don't like the way i feel about the art program procreate I'm satisfied and I'm probably never going to move away from that. And I don't feel that way about Foundry. It's great, but I'm still looking. And so I'm keeping my eye on things like Tailspire and hopefully something new or different will come out or maybe a big update with Roll20. Well, um, yeah, Wizards of the Coast are coming out with a competitor with Tailspire, <gasps> which... Uh... Oh, I'm excited. Yeah, so I just feel like, you know, they better get to work. Girl, get ready. That's what I have to say. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mo and Malik, for joining me. This was a little bit more than a 10-minute conversation. It was about two hours, including the 35 minutes or so that uh, was not kept. I'm probably not mm -hmm. going to put all of this in the video that I made, but I will probably cut it up and maybe release this as just like a like a, I was said in my like intro video for the, for the series that I do like podcasty stuff from time to time. I might release the mm -hmm. whole thing as a podcasty thing if you want, or maybe edit out some bits and bobs, but... Yeah, yeah, do I, it. I think I'll just kind of take like extracts from this this overall conversation just to try and keep it nice and short because I think the original video is like twenty minutes at the moment. So mm -hmm. <laughs> go for it. Yeah, I hope you got a lot of good stuff out of us. Um, yeah, it's been fun talking. <laughs> and I learned a lot mm -hmm. about umami. Umami. All right. Thank you. Thank you, BB, for inviting us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Goodbye.